Hello everybody out there in Bourbon Real Talk land. Randy Sullivan coming to you today with a very special episode. We are going to discuss the difference between bourbon and single malts. And I have a very special guest to help us understand all of that. I have Matt Drew. Thank you so much for joining the program today. Hey man, good to be here. Thanks for having me. You've flown all the way in from Missoula, Montana? That is correct, sir. Okay, and you are a maltster. Correct, yep. So you focus on the malting process of barley, mm -hmm. and you have a podcast called Single Malt Matters? Single Malt Matters, yep. Single Malt Matters, people. You heard it here. You need to go out, you need to check it out. If you're into malts at all, right? We're gonna talk about what a malt is, what a bourbon is. Uh, but we're standing here in front of a bunch of piles of grain and that's where the differences start. So you wanna jump into it? Let's do it. Let's do it. The first difference between single malt and bourbon are the grains, would you agree? Absolutely. Balcones is an amazing facility to film this segment at because they actually produce a lot of single malt and they also make some bourbons and they have the equipment to do everything from end to end for both types of spirits. And so we're gonna be able to showcase that for everybody. And, but in our hands, we have our respective grains that represent the spirit that we're out there championing <laughs> for, right? Is that fair to say? Absolutely. So yeah. what do you got in your hand? So this right here is uh, malted Golden Promise barley. And actually this is really cool because Golden Promise is an unusual barley cultivar in that it is actually a gamma radiated mutation mm -hmm. uh, of a traditional barley cultivar called Maythorpe. Okay. And it was bred specifically to be resistant to essentially salt water and, and uh, soils with high salinity okay. levels in them. So you heard it here first, this is the Superman of barley, okay? It's been gamma radiated and now it has superpowers and it can overcome adversity. Is that fair to say? It's the Incredible Hulk. Right it's here. the Incredible Hulk. Oh, because Hulk was gamma. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Superman's just an alien. <laughs> I always forget that. I'm not, a, I'm not a superhero guy. Well, in my hand, I have some blue corn which is not typically what bourbon is made out of. But here in Texas, we use some, you know, different grains and whatnot. Yeah, it's some sexy corn right there. It is, it, this is sexier than the regular bourbon corn, which would be Kentucky Dent. It's a yellow corn. It is kind of a commodity grain. Uh, but this is, this is a little bit different. It's grown here in Texas, some in New Mexico. And um, they actually typically toast this grain here before they um, actually grind it up and go into the next process. But bourbon, by law, has to be at least 51% corn. And that's what gives it its unique and sweet base of profile, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any requirements for what single malt has to have in it? Yes and no. Okay. So from a regulatory perspective, it actually follows the same rules. Malt whiskey is really the only defined malt forward spirit uh, in existence right now that's regulated by the TTB mm -hmm. and it follows the same guidelines. It has to be a minimum 51% malted barley in the mash bill. Right. That said, if you've got something that's labeled single malt whiskey, the average consumer knows and has an expectation of, of what that needs to be. That it's 100% malt. 100% malted barley. Yeah. And the vast majority of distilleries out there are actually following those traditional guidelines to make sure that the consumer is getting exactly what they're expecting in those bottles. So is it fair to say that bourbon culture started to grow in the United States before American single malt culture and that the regulations that were put in place for bourbon just kind of got copied and pasted over onto the American single malt world? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And, and traditionally, even before corn, it was rye. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, I mean, that's just kind of how a lot of things work though, right? You know, right. there's something new. Uh, we'll get to it when we get to it. In the meantime, let's just make it follow the same rules of the other guys. That makes sense, that makes sense. And I understand that there's some changes coming down the pike that may be really good to help American single malts grow outside of the United States. Um, tell us a little bit about that. There may be some changes to the regulations that'll make our product more acceptable in foreign market? Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges in front of uh, basically the global growth of the American single malt whiskey category has been the lack of regulated definition and the standard of identity here in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have done is through the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission, uh, we've been lobbying the T TTB 
to accept a wider definition of what that is that follows in line with what the average consumer internationally expects that grain bill to be and, and that production process to be. And we've just heard recently within the past week that we're going to hear back on that this year. So okay. that's, that's good progress. So it's a situation where American single malt producers may have an amazing product, but they're having troubles penetrating foreign markets because the regulations are too loose for those foreign markets to feel like they know what they're buying when they get it. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's, that's not too much of a stretch at all. If you've got something that's a brand new category uh, that is gaining in popularity globally, but the average consumer internationally understands that we don't have that same standard of identity, mm -hmm. there might be some hesitation and, and some reluctance to buy into something new when they can just go back and buy a bottle that they know has been established for a long time. So what's the difference between American single malt and scotch? Well, uh, the, the main thing uh, is that scotch needs to be distilled completely in Scotland, distilled I mean, through the whole process, um, uh, maturation, uh, distilling, everything needs to happen in Scotland, bottled in Scotland. Uh, and American single malt whiskey, the proposed standard of identity is just that. From start to finish, it happens in America at the same distillery, uh, and that it's 100% malted barley, and it's distilled to no more than 160 mm -hmm. uh, proof, and bottled at no less than 80 proof. Okay. And uh, the other requirement, honestly, because they're fairly loose, is that the maximum vessel that it can be aged in, in terms of like an oak barrel. It's 500. 700. That's the proposed to 700. Really? Yep. That's interesting. Yeah. Because the limit's 500 in Scotland, isn't it? Huh. We're not trying to be too restricted. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> we're we're trying right. to keep the door open. Well, that would get us at least in the same direction. And I kind of like that because Scotland is a much more aging, or in terms of the aggressiveness of the aging climate, is it's much more mild compared to most of the areas in the United States. Not all, but most of the areas in the United States that are making American single malts. If you are watching this, you can probably see that we are both glistening <laughs> because it is very hot in Waco, Texas. Yeah. And this is an aggressive aging environment. If you took a barrel from Scotland and brought it here, it would behave very differently. Oh, yeah. And one of the ways that you can fight that is by having larger vessels. There's, there's less um, surface area contact with the wood and so on and so forth. So maybe a 700 liter limit makes more sense because you can produce something that's more Scotch-like in a larger vessel in a hotter climate. And at the same time, that also opens up all kinds of opportunities for variations in regional flavor differences mm -hmm. uh, and different expressions based on where that stuff was made in the country. Awesome. Well, we talked a lot about the grain. Let's talk about the differences in how this grain becomes whiskey. You want to run over and talk about the, the, the milling process? Yeah, I'd love to. All right, let's do that. All right, Matt, so here we are. We are in the milling room at Balcones. And it's kind of a unique environment because most distilleries, I don't think, have both sets of the equipment that we're standing in front of. So tell the people, what is the equipment that you're standing in front of? So right here, we've got a roller mill. And the big differences and the reasons why you're gonna have a roller mill versus a hammer mill uh, are basically that malted grain, malted barley specifically, the malting process has done a lot of the heavy lifting that hasn't been done yet in process with unmalted grain like corn or rye. Right, right. So that kernel is already gonna be a lot softer. That's the main thing. Um, when you get into the mash tun and you start cooking the grain, gelatinization happens a lot more quickly. Uh, and those enzymes are already present. That's another thing that happens throughout the malting process is the alurone layer surrounding that endosperm starts generating enzymes. And as the hydrolysis or the, uh, the um, soaking into the water, the hydration of that grain is happening, those proteolytic, proteolytic enzymes can really get in there and do their job to break down those complex carbohydrates into shorter chain sugars. Mm -hmm. It also breaks down uh, a lot of beta-glucans, uh, which is the stuff that makes oatmeal real gummy and sticky. Right. Uh, and so when you get to the point of milling the grain and prepping it for actual mashing and then fermentation, you don't have to do as much to it. That said, the technology is a lot more complicated than it is in a hammer mill. Okay. In a roller mill, you've got a different sets of rollers that are set at different gaps. Right. Depending on the grain that they're getting, different grain is gonna have different kernel anatomy. It's gonna have different plumpness levels. So those gaps are gonna to have to be adjusted in order to crack it properly. 
But the other thing is, as one roller is moving at one speed, the other roller, as the grain enters the rollers, is going to be moving at a slightly slower speed. And what that's doing is it's pulling the seed around and it's removing the husk off of that grain because the husk is a really important part of the process. It really helps with filtration and it also helps to expose more of that grain so that it, when you do cook it, the whole process works more efficiently. Gotcha. So what you're doing is you're sending that grain through different sets of rollers to first remove that husk and then send it through that last set in order to crush it to the right grist consistency. Right. You don't want it too fine, you don't want it too coarse. Right. That's why it's so important to have a roller mill that has adjustable gaps. Sure, sure. And for bourbon, basically, we just want to pound the crap out of the grain until it's flour. And the, the, the reason why it doesn't make as much of a difference is going to be highlighted in our next segment when we talk about the difference between cooking a cereal grain and what is it called, a, a mash tun? Yeah. A mash tun. Because when you're making a bourbon, you are going to keep the particles of the grain as part of the process all the way through the uh, distillation. And so you're gonna have spent grain in the bottom of your still that went through the cooking process and everything else. But for, for uh, single malts, that's not the case, right? Don't you, don't you filter the solid parts of the grain off before you go to the, the distillation? It depends on the distillery okay. and the preference and, and kind of what they're looking for in the end product. Some distilleries, they ferment on the grain. Yeah. Others remove it out. Either way you look at it, that low level of beta-glucans in order to keep everything flowing freely and that chaff that's on the grain is really important because that helps everything process through much more cleanly and efficiently. What do you say we go over to the cookers and we check out the differences over there? Yeah, let's go check it out. All right. All right, Matt. Here we are. You got to cook your grist after you get done with milling, mm -hmm. right? And I'm standing next to a cereal cooker, mm -hmm. which is what you use for bourbon. And what are you standing next to? This is the mash tun right here. Mash tun. This is actually a traditional Scottish mash tun as well. Okay. Big difference here, obviously you've got a different type of grist, or different grain uh, that's milled that you're processing. So you're gonna need to treat it a little bit differently. And the other thing to remember too, is that you've got in that malt an entire separate enzyme package and those enzymes do what they do at different temperature intervals, okay. different zones. So uh, it's really important that when you mash in, that you're actually ramping up your temperature and you're handling that grain thoroughly and consistently so that there's, first of all, plenty of surface area that's consistently exposed to the hot water at those different temperatures so that those enzymes can do what they do in order to break down those carbohydrates into more simple sugars mm -hmm. and then uh, give the yeast what they need to do in order to make the party happen. Right, and for bourbon, it's not as complicated, I would say, right? I mean, I, it's complicated, um, but the equipment is a little simpler typically because this particular mash tun looks like a colander on the bottom. Yeah, it's got a false bottom in it. It has a false bottom, and, and the reason why is, is so you can pull off the juice if you're not gonna ferment on grain, is that correct? Yeah, and, and that's why having that husk intact and the whole retention score of that grain before you even mill it is so important because if you don't have enough husk, even if your beta-glucans are low, and even if it isn't gonna be really sticky mash, if you don't have enough of that husk material in there to act as a filtration medium, mm -hmm. it's still gonna get stuck. Right, and if you tried to put what you would put into a cereal cooker into a false bottom like this, and you went to filter it off, the particulate of the grain has been ground to such a small, fine particle size that it would just pass right on through, right through yep. and you wouldn't be filtering anything. Nope, so that is a, that's a major difference. Yep. Awesome. Well, what do you say we get out of this hot temperature and we go to some air conditioning and we talk about the rest of the process and fill them with B-roll? What do you say? Man, I'll meet you there. Awesome, let's do it. <laughs> We've talked about some of the differences and how you mill the grain and things like that. We got I think we can both agree that regardless of whether or not you're making single malt or you're making bourbon, distilleries are freaking hot places. Oh yeah. In the summer. 
True story, especially in Texas. Especially in Texas. Yeah. yeah, so we can agree on that. So what would you say the next difference is? Uh, aside from how you cook the grain after you've milled it, um, and you can have a false bottom, you can strain all the juice off, uh, what's, is there differences in fermentation? Yes and no. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, you're still using the yeast. You're still converting those sugars into alcohol. Mm -hmm. The difference is the yeast strain that you use mm -hmm. might vary depending on the flavor profile you're going for in your finished spirit. Uh, finishing, of course, is going to be a different thing altogether. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's, it's kind of its own beast that requires its own kind of special set of kid gloves and, and you just really have to pay attention to what it's doing in the barrel. Right. And, and that's also the case for bourbon. If, if you guys watch my episode with um, Brent Elliott from Four Roses, who they're kind of the yeast masters, uh, if you will, of the bourbon world, um, you know, you're going to use a different yeast profile or a different yeast to get different profiles in your distillate. Uh, but I think the fermentation process itself is not drastically different. Now, no. with American single malt, do they ever do a sour mash where they use sip, setback? So typically what you would do is after you make your cuts, um, this, is where, this is where that sort of philosophy comes into play. Uh, some distilleries will take their heads and their tails cuts, mm -hmm. they'll combine them, and then they'll put them into the next wash to then redistill. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of like a, a, a sour mash strategy per se, not so much. Not so much. So that is a, a pretty major difference because almost all bourbon is a sour mash process because they're all fermented and distilled on grain. You have spent mash when it's done. Um, they uh, put that in what I think is called a wash and they allow the pH to rise and then they'll put that into the fermentation tank with the, um, the freshly cooked uh, grist and that changes the pH and changes you know, how quickly the yeast consume the sugars and what esters you throw off and all that stuff. And that's something that's not very typical for single malt then. Yeah, again, you know, if, if your malt is what it needs to be, you've got everything you need going into the process from the very beginning. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so there are some differences in the fermentation process um, in that you, there's no sour mash. Let's talk about distillation. So my understanding is, you know, almost all, but not all, it's not a legal requirement of bourbon is made on a column still. It's, it's really only the craft producers that are making bourbon on pot stills or hybrid stills, um, which hybrid stills are just pot stills that have uh, plates in the column, similar to a, a column still, for those of you who didn't know. Um, the only major Kentucky producer that is using pot stills is Woodford, and even that suspect, because they also have column still distillate and they won't tell the public what the percentages are. And I've been to Woodford many times and I've never seen the pot stills running. <laughs> and I know how much whiskey they sell. And so it may be a, a, a scotch teaspooning situation where they're, they're dropping a teaspoon of pot still <laughs> distillate into their column still and saying, oh, it's, it's, it's pot still with column still. And then they just don't tell the people. So, Typically, bourbons, especially legacy distilleries, are column stills. Is that the case with American single malt? No. Uh, matter of fact, I've, I've seen a number of different distilleries that use hybrid stills. They'll use column stills. They'll use pot stills. And in fact, the proposed standard of identity from the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission actually does not have a still design requirement written into it. So gotcha. it's completely up to the producer on how they want to do it, as opposed to other countries where it has to be pot still. But you're familiar with all of the major American single malt producers. Would you say that the majority of them are using column or pot? You know, it, it's pretty even. Is it? Yeah. That shocks me. Because uh, doesn't a scotch have to be made on a pot still to call it single malt? It does. It does. And so we're kind of developing our own, you know, it's kind of like the word blend mm -hmm. in the United States, right? You can have a, a, a batch blend, right? And then you can have a blended whiskey mm -hmm. and then there's blended scotches and those are all the same word that mean completely different things, yeah. right? Yeah. 
Um, and so I, I find that interesting. Why do you think that there are so many people that are making American single malts on, on column still since traditionally they are made on pot? Well, I think a lot of it is, you know, you look at our American distilling tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of column stills already here. And frankly, this is such a new category that existing distilleries that have been making corn and rye based whis whiskeys for so long wanted to enter the game. They're not going to go buy a new still in order to do it. They're going right. to use what they've already got and then start seeing what they can what they can do with it. Do you have a preference for American single malt? You know, it really comes back to, I think, uh, it, it, I really feel that it's less about the still and it's more the skill of the person operating the still mm -hmm. and the person making the cuts. And it's not just any one magic bullet in the process. I think it's really understanding the full mastery of the entire process from the time the grain hits the dirt, frankly, until it goes all the way through the process. Um, I, I wouldn't say typically that I prefer a pot stilled single malt over a column or a hybrid stilled uh, single malt. Uh, again, it's, it just comes back to the quality of the juice and that all has everything to do with, with the skill of the person pushing the buttons. Sure. Um, now you have some distilling knowledge, right? You've used some terminology that I'm not familiar with. Um, would you say that uh, malted barley produces less oil than the typical bourbon mash bill with corn and, and, and rye in it? Not necessarily. Again, I think this all comes back to the distiller and what their preference is and where they make their cuts. Gotcha. You know, how deep into the heads and, and the tails they go in order to make their cuts. And that's going to have everything to do with that viscosity and that oil content in the finished spirit. Because for me in bourbon, and, and part of this has to do with just personal experience, right? Because when you're experiencing bourbon and you're trying things, you know, somebody goes, oh, this is a good bourbon or this is a mediocre bourbon. And you start to acclimate yourself to, oh, this is what good bourbon tastes like. It might just be that I've trained my palate to it, but I will definitively say that I prefer a bourbon that's made on a column still, even though it's totally legal to make one on a pot still. And I find that, especially in Texas, where I'm from, most of the craft producers have pot stills because starting off building your distillery around a super expensive column still is not in the cards for most people's financial situation, sure. right? And so um, I find that a lot of craft distilleries make pot still bourbon and it's so oily and viscous. Um, and yes, it has a much bolder flavor, um, but I don't know that that's what people's palates are accustomed to. And so I, I think that I personally prefer, um, with some very notable exceptions, that bourbon be made on a column still and American single malt be made on a pot still. Sure. And, and you know, that, which makes perfect sense. You're going to have a more highly rectified spirit at the end of a, of a column still process. Yeah. And I don't know why that is, except for the fact that I think bourbon gets too viscous and oily and thick. Um, on a pot still, and I just like a cleaner spirit before you start the maturation process. So. Sure, and it's a lot easier to control the process too. I mean, it also depends on the angle of the line arm on the pot still, because that's gonna allow more of those oils and those congeners just, to yeah. get through. Uh, and then that's obviously gonna have an immediate and direct impact on that. Sure, so uh, speaking of maturation, there's some differences in, in maturation uh, in, in bourbon and in American single malt. So most bourbons, and this is not a legal requirement, um, because there's, there's no size restrictions that I'm aware of for bourbon and how big the vessel can be that you age your bourbon in. The only requirement is it has to be a new charred oak container. It doesn't have to be a barrel. The oak doesn't have to be from America, despite what most people say. You can have Mizanara oak from China. You can have Hungarian oak. You can have whatever. Um, in fact, Balcones uses a lot of French oak and they use a lot of Hungarian oak and they impart different flavors. French oak tends to have more tannins. American oak tends to add more vanillin. Um, Hungarian oak, for some reason, adds a um, uh, cinnamon flavor. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, by law, it all has to be new. First fill, never used before. Um, is that the case with American single malt? As it stands right now, yeah. Uh, and again, it's important to it's important to keep in mind that 
when you're talking about the term American single malt whiskey, the words American and single right now are superfluous. They don't really mean anything. They're marketing terms. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. Um, really what it comes back to is malt whiskey. And right now in terms of the standard of identity and, and the legal requirements uh, from a regulatory perspective, it has to be a minimum 51% malted barley and it f has to follow the same rules as, as everything else. The, literally the only difference in, in malt versus a corn-based whiskey is the grain. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, all the same rules apply. All the same rules. Do you think that that is what the future holds for American single malt? Do you think that they will change? Because I, I know that in other uh, malt whiskey producing regions, the use of first fill barrels is actually not the norm. Right. That's, that, is, that is abnormal for them. Mm -hmm. They think that it's imparting too many barrel flavors. Um, and, and I think that consumers associate malt whiskey with a gentler aging in a used barrel that maybe will be influenced by what was in that barrel before. Sure. And that's part of the process. Do you think that it will continue to be the case that they don't allow that? You know, I think, I think honestly, the direction that it's going to go in is, and, and for a number of reasons, or at least this is my hope, is that that, that restriction on first use barrels, first use wood is lifted mm -hmm. uh, from the standard. And, and there, again, a whole lot of reasons for that. Um, but really what I think that does is it allows a lot more opportunity for differentiation in flavor profiles specific to the grain mm -hmm. uh, and the process as opposed to the barrel. Gotcha. Uh, and you know, the other thing that is always top of mind, especially right now, is there's a shortage of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and wood shortages right now is impacting everybody. And so I think if you are to lift the requirement on first use barrels, um, that takes a huge pressure off of the supply chain specific to what is available uh, and what is going to be used per the legal requirements of that spirit if a distiller wants to make that spirit. Hmm. So it may not even necessarily be a functional change that gets brought about because it's what the industry is calling for. It, it, it may be a financial necessity that forces that change because we're just running out of wood for barrels. Oh, sure. I mean, pretty much anything made of wood right now is about 180% more, more expensive than it, than it was a yeah. year ago. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's, that's definitely the case. So after maturation, uh, the maturing of the whiskey in the barrel, what are some of the other major differences between bourbon and, and single malt? You know, I really, at the end of the day, it all comes back to flavor. Okay. Uh, and there are obviously unmistakable uh, differences in flavor in that spirit uh, that you're going to experience between the two categories. So if somebody were to ask me, you know, what are the predominant flavors that I get from bourbon? I would say that across the board, you're going to get vanilla and caramel. And that's because of that new chard oak mm -hmm. container. Those are flavors that get imparted. The charring creates a caramelized wood sugar flavor that comes across as caramel and the um, barrel itself has a compound called vanillin that comes across as vanilla. Are there kind of ubiquitous tasting notes that go across the American single malt world? Yeah, and you know, for distilleries that are using the same maturation program uh, for their single malts as they do for their bourbons, there are actually a lot of crossover flavor profiles. Okay, um, like the, that makes sense. The, the brown sugar, the vanillins, um, you know, some of the lactones that are, you know, the whiskey lactone, CIS-3, methyl-4 octanolide is pretty, pretty common. Um, and from there though, um, you really start getting to more of the nuance of the grain. Mm -hmm. uh, an American single malt is definitely going to be more grain forward. Mm -hmm. You're going to taste that barley. You're going to taste that malt flavor. It's also going to be paired uh, with typically more kind of stone fruits, kind of some apricot some peaches, some plums. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's depending on where it's matured, where it's distilled in a cooler climate, uh, potentially is gonna be maybe a little softer, mm -hmm. a little prettier, more approachable. But still, I think that American single malt is a great uh, sort of entry point into a different style for the bourbon lover mm -hmm. because there are so many flavors in common. Right. Yeah, that's fair, especially in the United States where they are using first fill barrels uh, to have that designation. So anything else that you can think of that's different? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think, 
I think from a nuts and bolts sort of sensory perspective, you can only say so many things about the differences between the two. At the end of the day, a well-made whiskey is a well-made well whiskey, whiskey, you know? Yeah. Um, I think the, the biggest difference that I see, uh, and this is good, bad, or indifferent, right. is the community surrounding the American single malt whiskey category and its growth, um, I think is something that has been so rewarding to be a part of mm -hmm. and, and to see evolve and grow. And it's, it's really made up of some really interesting people doing some cool stuff that's all rooted in the same American distilling tradition. Sure. And so it's, it's an exciting time to be a part of this category and man, what, what a ride. And, and it's just in its infancy, you know, sure. there's so much potential and, and so much room for this category to grow, not even just here in America, but on the world whiskey stage. And, uh, you know, for, for, for people to be a part of it at this stage of the game uh, and helping to define it, I think is arguably one of the most exciting times in American distilling to be, to be doing this thing. I like that. I like that. Well, along those lines, if this is your first time watching the Bourbon World Talk channel, I'd like to thank you for tuning in and I'd like to welcome you. And uh, as Matt eloquently put, whiskey has a tendency to bring people together. And that's what this channel is about. We are all about bringing people together around brown spirits, whether it be American single malt, bourbon, rye, or really anything else. We want people to feel connected. And, you know, that's my philosophy about this channel. I see a lot of, you know, trolls in the whiskey groups that are making fun of people for liking this thing or that thing or, you know, j just trying to make themselves look superior because they have a better palate or they have more experience or they have a bigger collection. And that's really not what all of this stuff is about. Whiskey is about bringing people together. And, and my impetus for starting this channel was about being in and around that environment and seeing how large of a positive impact it had on people when they got involved in the community. And I, I was looking for something at that time that was gonna bring people together and help people feel connected because I just lost my brother to suicide. And <clears throat> it, it, it was something that, you know, I knew that he had problems, but I didn't understand how alone he felt and how disconnected he felt. And I wanted to make sure that nobody else had to go through that if I could do anything about it. And when I realized that whiskey was helping me to get toxic relationships out of my life because I was meeting amazing new people that I had something in common with that iron sharpens iron and they were making me strong and I was making them strong, I wanted to start a YouTube channel that would draw more people into this space so that they could feel that connection with others and that they wouldn't feel alone the way that my brother did. And so part of the impetus of this channel is to help people feel connected. Um, and, and, and along those lines, I see a lot of people showing negativity towards each other online around different ideological stances, you know, race, religion, sexual orientation, whatever the case may be. And I've seen at Bottle Shares that if you got people from those different groups, if you will, together, and you just gave them both a great pour of whiskey, and you ask them to talk about, you know, what they want for their kids or in their relationship or their career, they would end up friends, right? And those things wouldn't matter. And I figure if those individuals can show hate to one another that don't know each other online, it's just as easy for me to love you, even though I only know you from online and we've never met in person. And that's why I end every podcast with this. And that is, if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Microphone check, microphone check. What, what? Oh man, it's so good. I bet I look so handsome, bro. I bet I don't look glistening at all. <laughs>